Hello, and welcome to this GIS tech video on cartography and geographic information systems. The learning objectives for this lecture are to be familiar with data measurement principles as they apply to mapping, describe cartographic design principles such as visual variables, visual hierarchy, and figure ground relationships, be familiar with basic typographic guidelines, Describe basic concepts of map layouts. Be familiar with common rookie map maker mistakes. And compare and contrast various methods for implementing cartographic principles in industry standard GIS tools through hands-on demonstration. One of the first important ideas to understand in cartography is data measurement. Raw data is measured in four standard ways for map-based presentation. It is important to understand data measurement distinctions as these distinctions have map design choice ramifications and thus by extension how well or not the map will be understood. In the next slides I will discuss four standard ways data are measured. Nominal data are data where a code has been assigned to observations in the data. However, there is no numerical significance between codes. Nominal data are sometimes referred to as qualitative data. This image shows an example of geographically mapped nominal data. In this image, you are seeing a map of shrub, water, and unclassified land use categories. These land use categories do not have a numerical difference between them and are simply codes used to identify each land type. Ordinal data are data in rank order such as first, second, and third. However, there is no degree of numerical difference between items. A general example of ordinal data would be a survey questionnaire response such as very good, good, acceptable, poor, and very poor. Although there is a ranking between the responses, there is no indication of what specifically signifies one category for one another. In a mapping context, this image shows an example of ordinal data. In this image, you are seeing road networks that show a ranking of different roads based on the jurisdiction of the roads across federal, state, and county jurisdictions. Like nominal data, ordinal data are also considered a form of qualitative data. Interval data is data that has been ordered with an explicit indication of numerical differences between categories based on an arbitrary zero point. The classic example of interval data is temperature. For example, 10 degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Fahrenheit will not feel the same as they use different zero starting points for their measurement. This contour map is an example of interval data being mapped. Elevations shown in this map are measured from an arbitrary zero starting point of sea level. Interval data are a form of quantitative data measurement. Ratio data are similar to interval except that there is a non-arbitrary zero starting point as the basis for measurement. Ratio data examples include temperature measured on the Kelvin scale, age, and weight. Ratio is also a form of quantitative data measurement. Now that we've discussed data measurement, I will next talk about how data measurement translates into specific visual elements of a map and how they are represented. Maps are generally created using three graphical building blocks, points, lines, areas, in addition to text for labeling map features. From these basic graphical building blocks, data and map feature representation and the message that the data and the features are trying to communicate is done through what are known as visual variables. Visual variables such as size, shape, orientation, color hue, and lightness are not unique to mapping and are important overall graphical design device. In a mapping context, they are essential to understand for properly matching the correct visual variable with the form of data measurement being mapped. This figure visually outlines the ideas of visual variables and their relation with data measurement using a disaster management example. For example, the size of a point symbol 
that changes to indicate the number of people affected by a disaster. Or different color hues to signify different types of hazard vulnerabilities as a form of nominal data. Visual variables are powerful graphical devices for communicating messages in map form. However, when designing maps, it is important to remember to match visual variables correctly with data measurement of the feature being mapped. Mismatching visual variables, data measured, and features can lead to maps that miscommunicate. For example, using different color hues but the same level of lightness to represent quantitative data. Later in this video, I'll show you an example of a map created by a new GIS student with this issue. In the next slides, I'll discuss how map features are arranged in a map display in terms of visual hierarchy and figure ground relationships. Visual hierarchy is the idea that map features are presented in a manner that implies the relative importance of each feature. Often, visual hierarchy is achieved through visual contrast of map features. For example, this image shows an example of poor visual hierarchy. It is difficult to determine what the most important features on this map are, as there is little visual contrast between map features. By comparison, this image shows an improved visual hierarchy. As you can see, the circular map features are now creating a better visual contrast that implies the circular map features importance relative to the other map features. A closely related topic to visual hierarchy is that of figure and ground relationships. In a mapping context, figure and ground refers to the visual display of information such that elements that are intended to be the map's focus of attention or the figures are visually contrasted from map elements that provide the context or ground to the figure elements. For example, this image shows poor figure ground relationships as the figure and ground are ambiguous and cannot be determined from one another. By comparison, this image shows a hypothetical disaster example where the point of origin and impact zone of an explosion are displayed in black to make them as the figures as they are most important map features. The surrounding land use polygons are shown in a light gray and form the ground to provide visual context for the explosion extent figures. This image shows an example of figure ground relationships for a hypothetical disaster area map, but in this case, lighter colors are used to establish the figure of the disaster areas, and darker colors are used to establish the ground or areas that dis surround the disaster areas. Both approaches for establishing figure ground relationships are valid, and it's up to the map designer to determine which approach is best and ultimately will be easily interpreted by the map reader. In the next part of this lesson, I'll discuss typographic guidelines for map making. In addition to visual aspects of map design, it is important to understand basic typographic guidelines when designing maps. The following is a list of guidelines for use of type on maps. Try and avoid decorative type families like Comic Sans as they appear strange. Also, use bold and italic sparingly on fonts. Try to avoid more than two type families. For example, the first three words in this bullet point are a serif font called Times New Roman, which you can tell by the serifs or small marks at the end of each letter. The last four words in this bullet point are sans serif font called Calibri that does not have the serifs. As you can see, the mix of font types makes the overall text look strange. The type size you choose should generally correspond with the size importance of map features. For example, a map that shows cities would use a larger font for the capital city as opposed to a small town. When using tools like GIS, critically examine type specs. Don't just accept defaults that are given to you. Make sure that you're using the correct font based on what you're mapping. As always, make sure to spell check. Some GIS tools do not have automatic spell checking when you add text. One thing that I do when making a map is to keep a word processing program open where I can paste my map text into the word processing program to check the text spelling and then paste the text back into my mapping program once the text has been checked. In the next slides, I'll show you some examples of correct text label placement. In this example, 
we will look at design ideas related to where the best positions are for text labels in relation to map symbols. For example, if you have a point symbol, the preferred place for a text label would be the upper right of the point symbol. The second best spot would be the bottom right of the point symbol. The third best will be on the top left, fourth on the bottom left, fifth on the top of the symbol, and sixth on the bottom of the symbol. However, it is often the case that a different map symbol might block where the label goes. For example, in this image, we see the point symbol is next to a line symbol. In this case, you could use the preferred label spot of the top right, but the label is visually separated from its symbol and could cause ambiguity as to what the label is actually referring to. In this case, the third preferred label position can be used to keep the label near the symbol. Additionally, in cases where it is difficult to keep the label near its symbol, leader lines can be used to direct the label to its symbol. The label placement guidelines are applicable in these types of situations as well. For example, the upper right preferred position can be used with a leader line or whatever the best position available is. In the next slide, we'll look at some examples of incorrect and correct label placement. This image shows several examples of incorrect label placement. For example, note how all of these labels are not in the correct positions and thus making it ambiguous as to what the labels are specifically referring to. In this case, the label is overprinting onto the label for the river as well as the river feature itself. Here, we see that the leader line is touching both the symbol and the label. Finally, we see another case of symbol overprinting, this time with a label overprinting across a road symbol. Using the label placement guidelines discussed previously, we can address many of these issues. This image shows the previous map, but with the label issues corrected. For example, note how labels for the symbols in the upper left corner have been modified to use best label placement practice so as to remove ambiguity. Overprinting has also been corrected, and the symbol leader line has been resized so as to not touch the label or the symbol. And finally, a symbol mask has been used to allow the label to overprint cleanly on the road. In this case, the label has a gray background to allow the label to be blend with the background. Now that you've learned a little bit about the design of map symbols and labels, in the next part of this lecture, I will discuss the design of the overall map itself in terms of common map elements. Maps contain standard elements used to create a final map product. These elements include frame and neat lines, mapped area, insets, title and subtitle, a legend, data source attribution, scale bars, and the orientation. In the next slide, I'll walk you through some of these elements by looking at a map. In this image, you see a map of Poland. Many of the standard elements previously discussed can be seen on this map. For example, here you see the frame and neat lines that define the edge of the map. The mapped area, which in this case the map makers are using a figure ground relationship to contrast Poland shown in yellow with the surrounding country shown in light brown. The inset shows the broader context for where Poland is located in the world. Here we see the map title. Note how the map title for Poland and the surrounding country names like Germany are shown using a serif font, while names of cities in Poland are shown using a sans serif font. The map legend, which in this case shows many examples of ordinal data in terms of ranking cities and boundary types. And finally, the scale bars, which in this example are shown in both kilometers and miles. In the next slide, I'll discuss the ideas of sizing and positioning of map elements. Sizing and positioning is the idea that map elements, such as the mapped area, title, and legend, are at appropriate sizes 
and position correctly on the final map. These ideas are best explained with examples. For example, this image shows appropriate sizing and positioning of map elements. Note how the mapped area fills the frame appropriately and that the title, mapped area, and legend are centered with one another in terms of positioning. This image shows a map where the positioning of elements is appropriate, but the sizing of the map area is insufficiently small as can be seen by the large amount of white space around the mapped area. This image shows an example where, again, the positioning of the elements is appropriate, as can be seen by the fact that the elements are aligned center with one another, but the sizing of the map area this time is insufficiently too large, as can be seen by the mapped area overprinting on the title and legend, and the map area touching the neat line on the right side of the frame. Finally, this image shows an example where the size and position are both insufficient. For example, note how the mapped area is not centered with the title and legend and is too small, thus creating large amounts of white space. A topic closely related to sizing and positioning is map balance. In the next slides, I'll talk about balance. Balance is the idea that elements on the map are visually even and complement with one another. Like we saw in the examples of map labels and size and position, it can also be useful to look at examples of maps that have poor balance to understand the ideas of visual balance in a map. For example, this is an example of a poorly balanced map. Note how the map appears to be visually tilting to the right, as the title, legend, and scale bar are on the right side. By comparison, note how this map has better visual balance as the title has been centered over the map area and the legend and scale bar balance one another out visually by positioning on the bottom right and left. In the following slide, I'll give you some ideas on how you can achieve good balance in your map designs by examining available white space. When designing a map layout to create good visual balance, it can be helpful to consider the available space and how adding new map elements maintain visual balance. For example, when designing a new map layout, first consider all of the available space. Then, as you add new map elements to the layout, keep track of available space. For example, adding the mapped area and title to the layout reveals several spots of available white space that can be used to visually balance new map elements as they are added. For example, with the title and mapped area added, the legend then can be added in the available space on the bottom left of the map. With this addition, the map still has available white space that can be used to balance out the addition of the legend. For example, with the legend, mapped area, and title, a scale bar can be added to the bottom right available space that can balance out the legend and keep the map area and title balanced with one another. In the next slide, I'll talk a little more about insets as they are an important map element providing context to the map viewer. Insets are often small maps inside of a larger map layout that provide context and can serve several purposes. For example, insets can be used to locate the primary mapped area. In this example, the inset map on the bottom right corner is used to show where in Europe the area of detail in the main map is located. Conversely, inset maps can also be used to enlarge important areas or show areas that are congested with a large number of features. In this example, we see how a congested area has been enlarged to show specific details. As a prelude to a hands-on demonstration of cartographic practice using industry standard desktop GIS tools, I wanted to give you a few examples of common rookie map maker mistakes. These examples are drawn from real novice GIS students and demonstrate how GIS makes it easy to create a bad map. Study and refer back to these figures if you are new to making maps with GIS. A common issue with legend is to make sure that you remove all the underscores from legend items as those underscores can look funny. Additionally, Make sure to round numbers in your legends to decrease the number of decimal places, if possible. As you can see here, the excessive numbers of decimal places make these legends hard to read. When creating a scale bar, make sure you use even rounded numbers for scale bar increments. For example, 
These scale bars would be better if they ended at one kilometer or one mile so they are easier to interpret. When making legend titles, make sure that the titles are meaningful to people other than yourself. For example, the title CFCC2 might not be very intuitive to readers of your map. This map shows incorrect use of color hue with quantitative data. In this example, different color hues are being used to show population by country. As per the previous discussion in this lecture, a single color hue with changing lightness should be used for showing quantitative data. In the next part of this lesson, I'll give you a hands-on practical demonstration of applying cartographic design concepts discussed in this lecture through a simple map making exercise using ArcGIS software. In this hands-on demonstration, I'll show you two examples of map making. The first will be a thematic or quantitative data map of population counts in U.S. counties. In the second example, I'll show you how to make a basic reference map of European capital cities. In both examples, I will draw upon many of the ideas you learned about in the lecture portion of this video, so you can see how these ideas translate into cartographic practice. In this hands-on demonstration, I will use ArcMap desktop GIS software from ESRI. However, the cartographic ideas you learned about are software agnostic and encourage you to consider the ideas in whatever map making software package you use. In this first part of the hands-on demonstration, I'll show you how to make a thematic map of population counts within counties of New York State located in the United States. What I have open right now is ArcMap GIS and I'll show you the process from beginning until end. So the very first thing I want to do is to save my map document. So I'll put that in a directory that's near where my data is. And by doing that, I'll bring up Catalog, and you can see that I already have some data sets that I prepared for this demonstration. Now, a good practice to always do is, with a new map document, go to Map Document Properties and select Store Relative Path Names to Data Sources, and this will keep your MXD relative to any data that you might be working with. Okay, so, so we can see here in Catalog, I've got New York counties, New York census tracts, and so forth. So the first thing I want to do is add in the data sets that I'm interested in working in. In this case I'm going to do New York counties and I'm going to bring that over into the table of contents and I get something like that. And if I right click and take a look at its attribute table you can see here I've got the name of the county and I have the total population by county, the male population, and female count, female population. Okay. Now, since I'm really trying to make a real map product out of this, I'm going to bring some other data sets in to help create what you learned about in the lecture part of the video and what was called the figure ground relationships or the visual hierarchy. And to do that, I'm going to bring in this shape file of U.S. states, and I'll put that in there, and I'll just not worry about that. Okay. So one of the very basic things you can do to create figure ground relationships is to make these surrounding states, states that surround New York, make them a sort of lighter color to sort of put them visually in the background. And in this case I can do that by just clicking on the symbol for US states and make the fill color kind of a light gray. You can see even by doing that now there's a little more visual contrast between the states around New York and New York itself. Now ArcMap has a lot of ways that you can symbolize quantitative data and I'll use perhaps the most common way. I'm going to right click on the layer and go to properties and I'm going to go by default it goes to the symbology tab but if you for you it doesn't go directly to symbology you want to click on this tab here and you can see over here it says quantities so I'm going to select quantities and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make actually a map of female population in 
New York counties. So I'm going to pick from the value field, I'm going to pick female population. And you can see that I automatically get a single hue color ramp that's generated by default. So if I just take the default and I hit my apply button, you can see that I get a quick map of counts of female population. Okay. Now there's a couple important things to be aware of here. If you look over here where it says classification, natural breaks, you actually have several ways in which this data can be classified. If I click on the classify button, you can see here you have a number line. And these blue lines here rep are representative of the classes that the data observations are put in. So for example, most of the observations are in the 2,600 2,602 to about 55,000. And you can see that by the gray here. Now, if you go here, though, you can see that you have a lot of classification methods. For example, natural breaks, as the name implies, tries to find where the data sort of naturally breaks itself. So in this case, since I'm making a five class map, I have five classes from natural breaks. However, if I do equal interval, Notice how the number line changes because these data classes are now of equal or equal interval, meaning that each data bin has the same number that defines the width of the data bin. And when I hit OK and I hit apply, watch what happens now when I use the equal interval classification. Notice how the map changes slightly. And the reason being that most of the data in this particular data set is in this very first class. And notice that there's a few cases where data is in the, the top class down in New York City, and that's because the equal interval method is very good for revealing data outliers. So for example, in New York State, most of the population is in New York City, therefore they have more female people that live in that part of the state compared to the rest, what they call the upstate part of New York. So just be aware of the different classification methods. It was out of the scope of this video to talk about the differences between each one, but I encourage you to look this up in a standard cartographic textbook or even statistical classification book. Okay, so I'm going to switch it back to natural breaks and hit OK. And again, just see what happens when I do that, how the map changes. Now, one other important idea is the idea of normalization. So with quantitative data, whenever you can, you want to try to compare data values equally to one another. For example, as I discussed earlier, New York City has a generally larger population than the more rural areas of upstate New York. So it makes it difficult to make a meaningful comparison between counties in this case. So ArcMap has the ability to put a normalization on. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select this drop down. And so I'm going to look at female population as it is a percentage of the total population. Okay. So that's what you see now. See how these numbers have changed. And when I hit apply, you get a much different map when you look at it in terms of normalization. So now this is making more of an equal comparison of the number of females in each of the counties. And if you're not familiar with this part of the world, we're now seeing more of the cities in upstate New York are showing up. This is a city called Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, and New York, which urban centers tend to have more a bigger population in general, but also more of a diverse population. Another thing to point out, too, is that ArcMap will give you lots of options for colors through the color ramp. However, there's a tool that I've used for many years that I like for actually picking the colors for quantitative maps. And I'm going to bring up a web browser to show you that. This is a tool called Color Brewer. And these are scientifically valid colors used in map making. So for example, I'm doing um, five classes of sequential data. And you can see here, I've got some choices I can use for selecting single hues that change the lightness. And a really helpful thing about this is that you can get numbers to plug in for your map making. And the way that would work, for example, if I like, if I want to use, I'll use, say, the purple color scheme here, 
I can go into ArcMap and, and borrow the colors from Color Brewer, and I can also check, you know, if the colors are colorblind, safe, print friendly, and so forth. So these are important things to consider depending on what your final map is going to be. And you can go in and apply all of these values to the to your colors in ArcMap. Now to save time, I'm not going to apply all of the color brewer colors over to my map, but I just wanted to make you aware that that's out there. And the way that you could go about doing that is to set it to say the RGB value, and then you get the color, and then you go back to ArcMap, and you can double click on each symbol, and go to fill color, more colors, and then change the color model being used, and you can apply the RGB values here. Okay. So now that we have our, our quantitative data mapped out using Natural Breaks 5 class with a single color hue, let's work on the actual design of the map itself. Now we started by creating some figure ground relationships by making the states around New York a lighter gray color. Now perhaps maybe we want to put labels on those states to provide bigger context. Now, the basic way you can do labels is if you go to the U.S. States layer, right-click and go to Properties, there's a tab called Labels where you can start to build labels up. In this case, I'm going to do very simple labels for the surrounding states. And in this case, by default, it knows that I want state. You can change the font around, say, from a sans serif font like Arial to, say, Times New Roman. And basic things like bold or the size and so forth. Okay? And you click here, Label Features. Now, sometimes labels take a few tries to get them right, depending on what you want to do. If I hit Apply, okay, this comes out by default. Now, this, of course, looks very messy. We see that New York is being shown several times, and we actually don't want to label New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, so forth. So the basic labeling tools of ArcMap give you some options here. So, for example, placement properties. Placement, always horizontal, only inside the polygon is what we want, and we want to, in this case, remove duplicate labels. Okay? So watch what happens to all these New Jerseys. New York's and so forth, and I hit OK. So you can see just by doing that, it's cleaned up the labels significantly. However, I still have this issue here where the label for New York is showing, which I'm actually not interested in because I'm more focusing on the data being shown for New York versus labeling the state itself. Now, there's a couple ways that you can handle this. I'll show you one way that I would do it. What I'm actually going to do is remove New York State from the display of this US states layer. And the way I can do that is what's used to use what's called a definition query. So if I click on this tab here, what I can do here is basically I'm going to put a filter on the US states layer to remove New York from that layer. So if you watch one of my previous videos on SQL, you learned a little bit about these kind of tools. So I'm going to click on the query builder. I'm going to tell it, give me all of the records from US states where the state does not equal New York. Now when I do that, if this works correctly, we should see the word New York disappear in terms of the label. And it does because if you looked at what happened behind the scenes, when I turn off the New York counties layer, you can see there's actually a hole there now because I filtered New York out from the underlying US states layer that I'm using to provide figure ground relationships. So that looks like a pretty good start to building a map. So I'll show you now the layout view. And the layout view in ArcMap is accessed down here. And what this brings up is basically something that's designed to look like a piece of paper. So imagine that this is the piece of paper and now you're going to actually start building the map product using a lot of the ideas you learned about earlier in the video. Okay, given that New York is kind of an east to west type phenomena, we actually want to probably change the orientation of this page. So the way we can do that is go 
Map Document Properties. We go File, pre Page and Print Setup. And here you get your options for changing the orientation of the map page and so forth. So I'm changing it from land to landscape here. Okay, when I do that, notice how now the sort of piece of paper icon has changed. And this thing here is the data frame that I can then grab and start repositioning to fit on the paper better. And this is where now those ideas of balance and observing available white space and so forth become important for trying to make sure that your map has a good balance. So a really cool thing too about layout view is you can actually zoom in on the map itself. Now let's review some of these tools you get. In the layout toolbar you get a pan zoom in and zoom out tools. Notice how they it looks like the zoom in tool but it has like a little piece of paper behind it. So I can take that tool and zoom in on the map itself or on the piece of paper as opposed to the regular zoom that will actually zoom me in on what I'm trying to show in the map. So I'll use that tool to actually zoom my map in a little closer to make New York fill the data frame out better. Because in this case I'm really interested in showing New York and not the other things. They're simply there for figure ground relationships. So I'll try to fill that data frame out really good and so forth here. Okay. Now we'll start using some of ArcMap's built-in tools for adding various map elements that you learned about in the, le in the lecture. So the first thing we'll add is a legend. Now to do that you'll go insert legend and in this case I only want to have the county showing in my legend. It doesn't matter that I have the US states. They're simply there for background. So I will actually select those out of the list and I'm keeping with NY counties underscore two. I'll take the default name and I'll just take all the defaults but do know that you have things like you can put a border around the legend backgrounds drop shadows and so forth in some other settings and here we now have my legend that I can place on where I have available white space so remember back in the lecture video where I told you about trying to find the available white space. One option might be to use all the white space that's here. Might be a good spot to put the legend. Okay, now let's look a little closer at the legend itself. Several of the ideas that I mentioned in the lecture video are present here. For example, the use of underscores. This legend is not very intuitive and so forth by saying ny underscore counties underscore two female underscore pop. Now a cool thing about ArcMap is you have what are called live legends, meaning that I can make a change in the table of contents and that change in the table of contents will be reflected in my legend. So to do that all I have to do is go back over to the table of contents, right click, go to properties, then go to general instead of layer I'll change the layer name to New York counties and you can see when I do that it changes it in the legend on the layout and then the next thing I'll do is I'll make this heading a little nicer and to do that I go back to the symbology tab then the next thing I want to do is change this legend heading and to do that I click on it in the table of contents and I hit F2 to start renaming it and make it a little more intuitive and a little nicer presentation. and so forth. So now if we look at that and of course I always save your work. If I use my layout zoom out tool I can see now how that looks a lot better than just the defaults and so forth. And I can even zoom to the whole page to get a sense of where I'm going here. So now I want to add my other map elements. I've added I've added the legend and 
The next thing perhaps I'll add is the title. Now you get a, another toolbar in layout view called the drawing toolbar that gives you a lot of graphics you can add. To bring that up you go customize, toolbars, draw, and I'm going to dock that. And so for example if I want to put a title text, I can select text, and make it a more appropriate size for a title, something larger, and try to center that out. Okay. Now as I'm doing this, sometimes maps can take several iterations to get your design correctly. By putting the title there, I may decide that I actually want to move the legend down further on the page. I might be able to put it even sort of over Pennsylvania. and you do have masking options here as well you can also make it smaller so for example I'll make it a little smaller so it fits in nicely and so forth now I can start to add other elements to make this layout complete for example if I wanted to add an inset map to show where New York is within the overall United States the way I can do that is as follows. I can go up here and select insert data frame. And notice when I do that, over here in the table of contents, you get a new data frame that showed up that's in bold. And on the layout view, you can even see it here. And this is where I might stick a map of New York, or really the US states in here. So what I'm gonna do in this case is I'm gonna go to my table of contents. I'm gonna right click, copy US states, and then paste it into the new data frame. And you can see it might be a little hard to see, but all of the United States is showing up. And I'll zoom that map in on United States. Now again, a lot of these are very subjective decisions. You could have it show just the Northeast United States, which maybe I'll do in this case. So I'll zoom it in on the Northeast United States. And because I copied that layer, notice that New York is missing. So I'll use my layout tool to zoom in closer to fix this up. Go to the new layer and remove the definition query. And you can see that brings New York back. Now some other things I might want to do for the design here, if I zoom out a little bit on the layout, is to actually make the background here of the frame white so it can visually contrasts a little better and I can do that by right click properties and then in the data frame properties go to the frame tab and make the background white And you can see that'll make the inset map show up a little clearer by using available space on sort of I'm borrowing some space in Pennsylvania here to put my inset map. Now another thing you can do is make New York stick out more clearly from the other states. Now let me show you how you can do that. If I were to go to the US states layer and by the way too I'm gonna turn off the labels okay now under symbology I'm going to select categories and this time I'm going to select the state name and I'm gonna click add all values and what I'm basically gonna do is group all of the states that are not New York into their own display so first I'll uncheck add all values. I'll start with Alabama, highlight down just before New York using the shift key. So I've got a whole group. I'm going to right click, group those together. Then I'm going to go to from North Carolina down to Wyoming, group those together. Now I've got everything but New York. I'll group those together. This time using the control key. And I'm going to make all of that group, I'll make them white, but I'll make New York red to make it stick out. So 
So you can see now on my inset map, only New York is showing in red to indicate that that's the state of interest in this map. And I encourage you to experiment. That's just one way of doing it. As you saw in the lecture video, inset maps can use boxes to indicate things and so forth. Okay. Now other things you can add to the map, of course, are a scale bar. And to do that, you go insert scale bar. And you have a lot of different choices of scale bars here. I'll just pick an easy one right at the top here. And again, trying to find the open areas on my map, I might consider putting it down here because that, that will balance out the inset map with the scale bar. So if you think of this sort of as a, if you think of this in terms of balance, you have the title female population, the mapped area being balanced out between the inset map, scale bar, and legend, and so forth. And again, I'll use my paper zoom to look at what I have here. And by default, it's a strange number, 1,980. I'll take and stretch that in to fit in that space there. And I get 1,000 miles for the scale bar and so forth. Now, if you're happy with the way your map looks, you're ready to go with exporting it out of ArcMap. And again, there's a lot more that could be done to make fine-tune adjustments and so forth. But the key things are the use of the figure and ground. So in, case, in this case, the figure is the quantitative data showing female population as a percent of total population in the counties. The ground are the grade U.S. states behind it with some labels added for broader context. The cleaned up legend using easier to read titles. An inset map showing where the main area of interest is. And then a scale bar and trying to use available white space to keep everything balanced. And when you're happy with your output, you can then export the map out as an image by going File, Export Map. And then it depends on which particular image type that you want. I often use PNG. This is handy here, Clip Output to Graphic Extent. That will make sure that only the main parts of the frame are actually sent out. So I'll do that. And I'll send that out as I'll use the default. It uses the same as the map MXD title. And it writes out a file. And then if you go look at your file, you can see here now, here's my graphic exported from ArcMap. And this then I can then put into, say, I'm writing a report or something else like Word, here comes my map. So, so remember you have a lot of design tool options available to you in ArcMap and just keep those cartographic design principles in mind in terms of building a layout. In this second hands-on demonstration, we're going to make a reference map of European cities. You'll see a lot of similar ideas like I showed you in making the thematic map. However, a reference map is a good case for making a map that has more advanced label placement. So to start, I'll use a similar procedure like I did before where I'm going to create a new blank map document and save it near where my data sets are. So in this case, I'll save it right near my data sets. And like before, I'm going to select map document properties and store relative path names to my data sources so everything can stay nicely together if I have to move my map document and data off of this particular computer to somewhere else. And when I do that, if I go over to the table of contents, you can see I already have some data sets ready to go. Now, a couple things I need to do to start building this up. First off, since this is going to be Europe, I need to bring countries in. So here we have countries of the world. And I'll zoom in on Europe because that's what I'm interested in. And next up are the cities. So I'll bring those in. 
And I've also got this layer of world continents, which is actually very helpful for me creating figure ground relationships. So I'll bring that one in as well. Now there's several things that have to be addressed here. Since I'm only interested in Europe, I've got to make only display countries that are in Europe. If I look at the attribute table for the countries, there's nothing specifically telling me that they are in Europe as opposed to a different continent. Now there's a couple ways you can address this, this small issue. I'll show you the way that I do it, I would do it. So what I'm actually going to do is run what's called a select by intersect query to select only countries that are within the continent of Europe. So for example, if I look at world continents, you can see here I've got polygons that represent each continent. So what I'm going to first do is select Europe. And you can see but the blue line here is selecting everything in Europe. And then I'll turn countries back countries 2008 back on. It gives me the actual borders of countries. And then I'm going to go selection select by location. And what I want to do here is I want to select features from countries 2008 that using the selected feature, in this case Europe, or what they call the source layer, world continents, are going to intersect the source layer feature. So what I'm telling it to do is I want to select all of the all of the records from countries that are intersecting the selected record of world continents, in this case Europe. And so when I hit apply, you can see now that a lot more countries have been selected in Europe. And if we take a closer look at that, if I turn the world continents off, you can see that all of these blue of Europe have been selected. So what I can do now is a little trick I like to use sometimes is I'm going to make a slight modification to the attribute table of countries because now I have only records from Europe that have been selected for the most part. And if I go down here, I did notice that Turkey got selected, so I'll unselect that one by finding its record and unselecting the highlighted. So that'll take that out of my mix. And one other thing is Kazakhstan is not part of Europe, so I'll also go and unselect that out of my set. And for the most part, I should have all of Europe now selected. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to create a new field and I'm going to call it Europe and I'm actually just going to make it a short integer or number and I'll hit OK. Then what I'm going to do is go on that new field again with my selected records 53 of 249 right click and bring up the field calculator and I'm going to make Europe equal to 1 meaning that all of the selected records will have the number 1 added to them in terms of a data value and I'll explain how that why that's important in just a moment so I'll hit OK and so you can see everything now has Europe as 1 now if I reverse the selection So now I've selected everything other than Europe. I'm going to go to the Europe field that I just created. You can see everything else is selected. Field calculator. I'm going to make those as make those a zero. Okay. So why did I do all that? So what that can help me with now, I clear the selection. You might remember from the previous demonstration, I used what was called the definition query to actually remove New York State from the other states. In this case, I'm going to filter 
countries out so it's only showing the countries in Europe and to do that I'm gonna right click on countries and go to properties and in this case my definition query query builder again so you can see how that chops a lot of other countries out so I can only focus on Europe as per my goal of creating a reference map and then I can come back and I'll turn the world continents on and that gives me some context around Europe because I'm not necessarily interested in the boundaries of other countries that are not in Europe but I am interested in the boundaries of Europe okay now again like you saw in the previous demonstration I can start to create some figure ground relationships I can make those world continents by clicking on their symbol a light a light gray fill and the countries in Europe I'll actually make them perhaps for now I'll make them white if they stick out a little a little better or perhaps even I'll make them uh, maybe a yellow color so now we see a little more visual contrast that that's what you're paying attention to in this map now the next thing I need to focus on is I'm creating a map of just capital cities in this case so what I'm gonna do is look at the cities attribute table and in preparing this I did indicate what continent the city is from so you can see here you have the name of the city its country population capital yes or no and then what continent it's on so we'll use definition query again to determine to show only countries that are capital cities in Europe and to do that as you've seen before I'll go to the properties of that layer definition query in this case I want to select from cities where capital equals yes and continent equals Europe now we should see that really filter things down pretty good so now there's only as you can see about one as there should be only one point per country okay and maybe we'll change that a little less yellow there so now that we've got our mapped area of interest we've got a little bit of figure ground relationship going on let's work on actually symbolizing the country capitals themselves so from cities I can double click on that point symbol and I can try to find a more meaningful symbol for example a capital city is sometimes shown with a star and a circle I can try that and perhaps that's alright but I just want to make you aware that if you were to go under style references you get all kinds of other ways of finding different kinds of symbols to base depending on the domain you're in for example real estate survey transportation and utilities and so forth another option I have is too I can select symbol selector perhaps try my luck and see if I can find capital as an option and sure enough here we have a, an official sort of symbol for a capital city I'll go with this one okay and I can make those a little smaller perhaps and so forth now another thing to make sure that you're aware of for a map like this let's say that you know the final map you want to be printed at is going to be 1 to 25 million scale okay and you've decided that you really like that the the size of these symbols for capital cities is going to work good for what you want what you can do is set what's called a reference scale and that will make sure that basically what you're seeing in the map view will be maintained in the layout view for example if I go to set the reference scale I'm gonna to go to layers right click properties and then under general I'm gonna set the reference scale which right now is none 
um, I'm going to use the current scale. I'll hit apply. Now watch what happens when I zoom in on these symbols here. Notice how these are actually very large. If I were to, because what's happening is ArcMap is trying to maintain the view and design of those symbols based on that reference scale. If I were to go, if I were to go back and change it or remove it, watch what will happen to these what are now large symbols. They'll scale back down to the current view. So use that reference scale if you have a particular scale you're trying to make a printed map with. And it's important to maintain the size of your symbols. So I'll put that back on. We see that pop up. But if I go back again to my 1 to 250, 25 million scale map, you can see the symbols are, are scaling properly. And it's the as you zoom out, you get an opposite effect where everything will start to look small. Well, that's a little too far out, but if I zoom in, large, and so forth. So those symbols, because they have a reference scale set, are not changing their size. Okay. So let's look a little closer now at labels. In this case, I want to create a label for each country and then a label for the actual name of the city. And this is where the labeling functionalities of ArcMap can be very uh, helpful. And to show you how to do a little bit more advanced labeling, I'm going to bring up a special toolbar called the Labeling Toolbar. I'm going to get that by going Customize, Toolbars, Labeling, and I'll dock this toolbar. And one of the first things with the labeling toolbar is select from here, say use Maplex label engine. And this is a more powerful labeling engine than what you saw in the previous demonstration. So I check that. And now I go to the label manager. And this is a whole dialog designed to help you with making labels. So for example, right now I've got three layers in this map. And they all have default what are called label classes. And here, from here I can make changes to how labels are displayed. So for example, let's start with the cities. I'll use a sans serif font, perhaps um, bold, and I can quickly turn it on just by checking it here, and then hit apply. And you can see that it actually does a pretty decent job, but you get now a lot of choices here for example, you can see those ideas of label placement that you learned about earlier in the video, how it's going to automatically try to get the best position, but you can see all of those other positions are available to you if you want to purposely make a label in a certain spot. So just for demonstration purpose, if we made all the labels on the north, so watch the map when I hit apply, see how they all shifted now, they're being forced to be on the north part of the symbol, which may be okay, but in this case you really often just want to stay with the best position. So you can see in many cases it's using that upper left position. You also have other options where you can see the offset. Right now it's set to one point. If I made it half a point, If I make it a quarter point, it tries to pull the labels closer to the, the actual thing. If you look at the properties, you also get some other options. For example, do you want the label stacked if it has multiple words? Removing duplicates like you saw. And how the label relates to other features. So for example, if I change the feature weight to say 600, watch what will happen now with the labels. See how some of them shifted to try to avoid overprinting onto other symbols and so forth. So a lot of these things will take a little practice to find out what's the best 
thing for what you're doing, but the point is to be aware that these things are out there. So continuing with this idea, let's create some labels now for the countries. And the countries we're going to want to use figure ground relationships. We want the name of the country, but we don't want it to be very visually prominent. So in this case, I'll go to the default class for the country name. And I will make it a different kind of font. And I'll give it a gray color. And you can see now similar issues where we have lots of duplicates, but you can see that they're on there. So again, you have a lot of options, like you um, can remove the duplicates. So you're only getting one per country and so forth. Now the label manager will get you pretty far with getting some good labels, but in this case you can see there's a lot of labels that still need a lot of work. And one option I like to use is what's called the annotation manager. And the idea here is that you're going to take these labels and once you feel like you have a general layout of those labels, you can convert them into annotations that have a little more flexibility over how they're specifically put on the map. Now I strongly recommend that you Turn labels into annotation only when you're ready to make sort of final edits to the labels. Once labels get turned into annotations, it can be very difficult to go back and change things. But for example, I've got my country names, I've got my capital names, and so forth. I want to work on cleaning some of this up. So for example, it's very messy around here right now in terms of labels and so forth. And so what I'm going to do is I'll first deal with the uh, country name labels. I'm going to go to the countries layer, right click and select convert labels to annotation and this will take the labels and make them into basically text graphics that are no longer associated with the lay with the underlying layer but allow give me more choices in how I can actually lay things out. And in this case I'm going to store them just in the map and here's my reference scale that I set before and so forth so I'll run this and so now when I go and click on one of these labels with the drawing toolbar so for example I don't actually really want to label Vatican City as a country I can go and click on the label for Vatican City because now it's basically a graphic I can take that label move it or delete it I don't need to have a label for San Marino. I'll delete that. And I can take, say, the word Croatia and move it over into the, the water here. And I'll take the word for Hungary because it's overprinting on the symbol, and I'll move it into some available space and so forth. I can do the exact same thing um, with my cities. If I'm happy with the general layout of the the general design of those labels, I'll go to cities, convert those labels to annotation. Again, at my reference scale of 1 to 25,000. And I can make modifications. For example, I can move the word Budapest closer to the symbol. I can put Vienna. I can put Vienna back into Austria. Again, trying to use my label positioning that I learned about earlier, and so forth. I can put Bratislava back in Slovakia. And as you can see, this will take a lot of time to get this all cleaned up, but map making is a, uh, especially this kind of map, is a slow process, so be ready for it. Now, one thing to make you aware of, when you convert things into annotation layers, you have the ability to turn those annotation layers on and off. And the way you do that is if you go to the data frame layers, right-click, go to Properties, you can see under this tab annotation groups you can see for example my cities if I were to turn the cities off and apply all those labels go away so that gives you some control too on 
how things are actually displayed once you get to annotations. Okay. So for sake of time, I'm not going to go through and, and fix every single label on this map, but I hope you got a sense of how I set this up. Now, if I go back to that reference scale of 1 to 25,000, and I'm happy with all my label placement, and again, you know, because they're annotation layers, you can move things around accordingly. Let's go and make a map layout um, very sim similar to like you saw um, in the previous example. I'm going to go to the layout view. And the key thing here now is notice that when I went to the layout view, my scale changed from 1 to 25 million to about 1 to 29 million. And so I really, if I want my map at 1 to 25,000, I have to set that scale. And then I can see how things are going to look. They're going to look the same as they did when I was over in the, the map view for the most part. So just keep changing things back to get it the way uh, you want it to be. And sometimes you do need to make adjustments and so forth to keep that scale. And similar to like we did before, this is where you can now start adding your inset maps and map elements and so forth. So always keep an eye out for, the, for your white space that you have available. So for example, the map title. I can put up here, there's a nice white space there. And I can use the drawing toolbar to change things like the font size and so forth. ArcMap also has a lot of options that you might be familiar with from other graphical editing things. So for example, to keep the balance between the mapped area and this title, I can select the title and then I can select the title and the mapped area together and then if I right click over one of the selected objects and I select align, align center, you can see now how the title has been lined up center with the mapped area and that's very important for getting good layouts where everything is lined up and looking neat and so forth. Some other things to show you that you may not be aware of if I again back to legends if I go and select a legend um, in this case I only want city so I can remove items from my legend in this case it's a very basic legend and maybe I might choose to put it even right up in that corner right there was a lot of white space you have this interesting option of being able to um, change the legend by sort of exploding it. So for example, right now the legend, as I showed you previously, if I wanted to change that and call it, say, Capital Cities, I can do that. But there might be a case where once you get that laid out, you're simply not happy with it. So something you can do is if you, I can select my legend, right click and select convert to graphics. And this will break sort of the live link between the table of contents and the legend, but it also gives me a lot of options. So right now it's a graphic. So if I were to change this and call it Capital Cities Europe, Okay, notice how it's called Capital Cities Europe, but it's not, it didn't change in the legend because it's now a graphic. If I right click on my graphic and do ungroup, that'll start breaking things into smaller pieces. So for example, the word legend, if I don't want to have the word legend, maybe I'll call it key instead of legend. That allows me to change that. And over here, I can also ungroup all of this. Again, that breaks it into the symbol and then the words. I can change that and I can then say move this closer and so forth or perhaps I want to put the word over there. I can highlight these things and using a combination of tools now I have my symbol and my text. I can use my align tool to align these things vertically center so you see that shifted down and then I can regroup them with two of them selected I can right click and do group 
making them one object. And then if I want to center this word over this graphic, and I can select align, align center, and get those two things together. And just to follow up with what you saw, perf saw previously, I can set up an inset map by going insert. I'll put a new data frame. You can see how that comes on the map. And in this case, I might try to use, again, I'm looking for available white space on my map. In this case, Africa is pretty handy because there's I'm just putting it in there for context or figure ground relationships. <clears throat> I can grab the world continents layer, copy that, put that in the new data frame. and zoom this data frame in on sort of around Europe and I can modify that frame to give it a white background to give it a little more contrast and I could perhaps in this case use some graphical tools from the drawing toolbar to indicate if I use a rectangle in this case I'll make a big rectangle kind of to kind of point out where the area of interest is and so by default I get a yellow fill that I can change make it a no color or hollow fill and I can change the outline to be red to kind of highlight that I can throw a little text in there And so forth. Save my work and you're on your way. Now I didn't mention before um, you also have a, a wide variety of north arrows that are available to you. Again a lot of these things come from the insert. You get your, your standard map elements, all kinds of different north arrows. Again just always think of where that north arrow or anything else is going to go in terms of the balance of your map like for example it might be good to put the north arrow up here and like a lot of other graphics I right click on it and go to its properties I can give it a white background to make it mask out anything behind it so you can see that it masks out a few of the North Atlantic islands up there one other thing to mention for maps like this as well is that you have the ability to put uh, grid marks on this. So, so for example if you wanted to have reference to latitude and longitude you could click on your main mapped area here go to properties and then if you click from grids you can create reference grids around your map and they have this very handy way of going through this wizard to uh, define this. So for example I'll do graticules, meridians and parallels or latitude and longitude lines and again this is one where it'll t it could take a lot of tries to get it the way you look. I'll just go through the defaults in terms of divisions and so forth and text style and so then I have that on there when I hit apply you can see now that a latitude longitude grid has been added that you also have the option to turn on and off depending if you want to use it or not. Some people will have multiple grids on their map. One could be latitude, longitude, one could be UTM, universal transverse mercator coordinates and so forth. Okay. So keep in mind all the different cartographic design options that are available to you through ArcMaps tools and keep those design principles in mind in terms of figure ground relationships, visual hierarchy, label placement, and other things to make a good map that has good design and can effectively communicate what you're trying to show in the map. In this lecture, you learned about data measurement principles such as nominal and ordinal or qualitative data and interval and ratio or quantitative data as they apply to mapping. 
You also learned about cartographic design principles such as visual variables, visual hierarchy, and figure ground relationships that can help you with proper design and visual display of map symbols. You also learned about basic typographic guidelines that can help inform you about what types of font to use and how to correctly place labels around map symbols. You also learned about basic concepts of map layout such as sizing and positioning, balance, and common map elements such as insets. You also saw some examples of common rookie map maker mistakes such as improper legends, poorly rounded scale bar numbers, and improper use of color. And finally, I showed you some methods for implementing cartographic principles in industry standard GIS tools through hands-on demonstration. Specifically, you were shown how to make a thematic or quantitative map and a reference map. Remember that the cartographic ideas are not software specific and you should apply these ideas in whatever tools you use. The following are references used in preparing this lecture. If you enjoyed this GIS tech video or have any comments or questions, feel free to contact me at the email address below. Thank you for watching.